us today for the event. Um, before we begin, I'm going to start with three Navgar Mantra. So um, yeah. you can take a sip of water or um, hold your hand. I mean, that one. Namo Arihantanam, Namo Sitanam, Namo Ayadiyanam, Namo Vijayanam, Namo Loyasavasahunam, Eso Panchinamukaro, Sava Pava Panasano, Mangla Rancha Savisim, Padamam Hawe Mangalam, Namo Arihantanam, Namo Sitanam, Namo Ayadiyanam, Namo Ojayanam, Namo Loyasavasahunam, Eso Panchinamukaro, Sava Pava Panasano, for today's session, we are joined by Mumukshu Tanya Ben Shah and Mumukshu Karan Bhai Shah. This brother and sister pair were born in Denver, Colorado and Detroit, Michigan in the United States, respectively. Their early education and joint studies took place in America, where they had the unique opportunity to live near the magnificent Detroit Madre Sami Temple for 10 years. This proximity allowed them to partake in almost daily visits, periodic puja, and also attended the Sunday Jain Pasha classes at this Dirasar. Through structured courses covering the Jain Sutras, philosophy, rituals, and practices, they are enriched their understanding of our great religion. With the blessings of Dev, Guru, and Dharma, the entire family made the decision to return to India in 2015 and chose Varodra Gujarat to settle down in. In 2017, under the auspicious presence of Acharya Radna Sundar Suriji Maharasai, they enrolled in Uptan Tap Aradna, which ultimately culminated in the wearings of the Mokshmala. Mumukshu Tanya Ben Shah has also translated seven books of Acharya Ratna Suri Ji Marasai from Gujarati to English. One of these books, The Way of Happiness, is available in the United States. Both Mumukshus will be taking Diksha under the guidance of Acharya Ratna Suri Ji Marasai in January of 2024. Today, we have all gathered here to learn more about their journey and gain inspiration from their lives for ourselves. Um, and we're gonna go right ahead and jump in with our prepared questions. Mm -hmm. But feel free to drop your questions in the mm -hmm. form in the chat and we'll try to weave them in. So the first question we have for you is what does taking Diksha mean for you guys? Would you like to start, Karan? Okay. Mm -hmm. Taking Diksha means uh, becoming a monk and then like it's a procedure in which we renounce the world and we dedicate our lives to our guruji and uh it means becoming a jain monk or a nun we renounce all of our worldly possessions and attachments and live a life that's free from sin um and how we do this is we do not uh, harm even a single living being in any of your any of our daily activities like when we travel we don't use vehicles so we walk barefoot then we don't touch any electrical appliances because we're harming not a single, uh, not even a single living being from like Ek India to Panch India. And we um, welcome hardships into our lives to shed our karmas and eventually reach our goal of moksha. So for this, uh, to attain this goal, we um, welcome hardships like loch and vihar into our lives. And we don't cook food, so we go and get gochi. So that's basically our ritual after we take diksha. Thank you guys so much for answering that question. Um, the next question that we have for you is, what was the catalyst for you guys in taking your spiritual journey to the next level and ultimately deciding to take Diksha? I think Karan can tell this story. Yes. When I was like just six years old, my mom was watching a video on YouTube. I took a glimpse and saw that it was an Acharya Bhagwan giving a sermon. I got interested and asked some questions like who is he and what is Diksha? I don't know how these questions sprung into my mind, but it must be some coincidence or something I did in my past life. 
after that my interest increased and then when we shifted to india and i met gurudev for the first time i really liked him and i went every weekend to do vandan and all that then after that in december like about 6 years ago gurudev said that there's an obdhan tap going on and all four of us went there and i really enjoyed staying there i was crying when we had to come back home after that i went in summer vacations to stay there me and my sister my sister went to a sadhvi ji bhagwan and after that in doing 10th grade i left school and then stayed there so like step by step my bhav for diksha has increased and now finally in this june uh, our gurudev and my guruji granted us permission to take diksha and now on 24th we are going to finally be taking diksha thank you guys so much for sharing that really inspiring story with us the next question um that we have for you is what role did jainism play in your lives growing up oh it played a huge role especially since we lived in america like in india uh everyone follows religion there's uh it's a big part of everyone's lives but in india where um jains are even fewer than in india the community is much smaller um i think attending study class like pachara at the temple played a huge role in making uh forming the foundation for jains in my life like we learned about the principle of ahimsa right and that played a huge role in how i treated other human beings and especially animals as well like uh and and it played a huge role and it came to my diet like following the jain diet of not eating any root vegetables um all of this stemmed from learning about the himsa and the second huge principle is uh anekantva definitely um it it's unique to jainism and it helps us to learn that there are lots of different perspectives in the world and it kind of uh helps us to avoid competition which is which is a huge poison in today's competitive world so uh, you want to add about it in my parchala i learned lots of basic things like yeah. stotis sutras chaitya vandana and all that and also that you should not eat root vegetables and that gave a nice start to this religion and also the fact that there is a temple really close to our house it instilled a love for bhagwan and me uh, very early in my life i love to do go to the uh, there as sir do bhakti puja and that i carried that love on all the way to india and that's also what helped shape my life for diksha thank you guys so much for answering that um the next question we have for you is can you guys describe your experience during uptan as well as what this stuff is for um those people who may not be very familiar with this term. Okay. In Uttanta it's a 47 day long tapasya and you basically live like a monk or a nun for those 47 days under the vrat of Poshad. So it's like a day long samik for 47 full days and you do alternate fasts like uh, on the first day it's an upvas, the second day it's a nidhi which is kind of a special ikashna and uh it's alternate and then there are special rituals you do so every day you do a kausa of 100 logas and you give 100 kamasamans and at the end of these 47 days you receive like a uh, like we've been reciting the mantra mantra for as long as we can remember but the actual license to recite this mantra is given when you undertake this 47 day tapasya and at the end of it you're eligible to actually recite the noka um your experience in singing in the passion yeah. The, ex <clears throat> the experience was really nice staying in the opashray all of the kids who did ugran tap were allowed to stay there for the whole time and uh, we were, we received nice care and love and affection from all the sadhu bhagwans they took great care of us and the experience was really nice and smooth for me so with um gurudev's blessings like uh before we started it seemed almost impossible to do alternate fasting all of these rituals waking up early in the morning and doing pratik ramayan two times but thanks to gurudev's grace it all happened very smoothly it was it was really an enjoyable experience and i think that's what uh kind of sparked 
the desire to take Diksha in both of us? Yeah, and I guess a little bit of a follow-up to that. Um, what part of this talk was the most impactful for you? Oh, well, definitely realizing that it, a life, uh, it's possible to live a life where you don't, like it's not necessary to harm even a single living being, like in Uptanta, you, you walk barefoot, you don't use vehicles, it's just like Diksha, and and at the end of the day, you feel such like an enormous sense of relief to have lived through this day without killing another a single living being. And when we came back home, we realized how many like how many meaningless sins we commit in our day to day lives, like running the tap, walking on grass, using vehicles, using electricity, and it kind of felt sad once we came back. And uh, to add to that, there's also uh, in Uktanta. We devote the entire day to God, to um, worshiping God. And then when we came back home, we realized just how little time we take out of our daily lives to give to uh, to give to Bhagwan, to studying, to doing uh, jaf and so on. So it helped me decrease the amount of sins in our daily lives and increase the amount of worship. Yeah, thank you guys so much for answering that. Um, I know you touched on this a little bit, but what are some of the learnings from this talk that you were able to apply to your daily routine upon the completion of the talk when you return to your um, regular worldly life? Oh, okay, like what I said that um, I was able to reduce all the meaningless pop that I committed in my day-to-day -day lives and uh, spend less time basically on things like just watching TV or time I spent on my phone and instead try to make use of that time to move closer towards my goal of taking Diksha because uh, once I'd experienced staying with my Guruji in Uksanta, I stayed in the Upashri too and I missed it so badly when I came home. So once I came back, I tried to do more Samaiks, more Pratiklamans and eventually uh, try to convince my parents to let me go to stay with my Guruji. Yeah, um, I guess like considering most of the audience on this call lives in India or in America, what was the main difference you were able to see and or feel between practicing Jainism in India versus here in America? In America, there are Jain temples and all that. So you can do darshan, puja, study class and all that. But there is one feature that is lacking there. Actually, two features. One is that there are no Maharaj sides in USA. And the other fact is that you cannot stop all pap in USA. It is like next to impossible. You need to use a heater in winter season. And there is no guidance of a guru that helps us stop all these sins or like advice to go on in this religion. And when we shifted to India, there are like so many more Jains, Shravaks and Sadhu Sadhvi Bhagwan. So we could get guidance like every day and pravachans and all that. Okay. And um definitely in America you have uh you guys have every facility available. Like you have huge spacious temples, you have uh pollution, you can do Pratik Lamarn and so on. You have Ambiluni. You can do any kind of tapasya there. So um, in America, I feel like because there are a lot more facilities, there are a lot more chances available for you guys to do dharma. But definitely, like Alan said, uh, it's impossible to renounce every sin there because there are those in inevitable sins that you commit every day. But moving to India has shown me that a life is possible, uh, a life free of sins. Yeah, that's really helpful to hear. Um, one more or one other question we have for you is, while most of us have decided or not decided to take the path that you have, what recommendations do you have for us to dive deeper into Jainism and our own spiritual, spiritual journey, especially that we are living in America? You should keep visiting India because over there, you can receive the guidance of Sadhu Sadhvijis. 
and that will really help you go on. And you should keep on studying, Jainism, go to study class, even if it means missing some classes or <laughs> school related things. Because if you have a continuation, then it will really help you go on in this religion. Um, yes, like Kal said, I think it's really essential that you keep visiting India because that's the only place where you can go and actually meet face to face with Asad or Sadhguru Bhagwan. And these are the people who will actually uh, give you real deep guidance for your lives. And we all have a lot of questions. And these questions are best answered by someone who's learned, who can give you like pro uh, proper answers to these. And definitely in India, the Jain community is a lot bigger. So if you come here, you can expose yourself to, well, the, the Aradna that people do here. It's at another level. And you can visit Jain Dutes. But of course, staying back in America, like Karan said, there are also a lot of things you can continue to do. And, uh, and I've seen the libraries and the temples that you have over there. And they're really extensive. And you can definitely study on your own as well. And studying is uh, swadhyay. It's definitely essential because it's what it teaches you more and more. And uh, the most important part from learning is to implement these things in your lives. And um, our Gurudev actually, uh, Acharya Bhagwan Sri Madhvijay Ratna Sundar Suleeshwar Ji Maharaj Sahib, he, uh, in India, people listen to Pravatans like almost daily. And this is what motivates them to keep doing Dharma daily in their lives. But in America, you guys don't have uh, Sadhu or Sadhu Ji Bhagwans. So my Gurudev has a YouTube channel called Ratna World. And I'm sure many of you might have already heard of it. And his Pravatans come almost daily on that channel. And you can definitely listen to those. They are very heartfelt relations. They're simple, to, like simple things you can implement in your daily lives. And that is actually uh, my mom. When she listened to these relations, that's actually what inspired her to move uh, from America to India. So definitely check out that channel. Thank you guys so much for giving us that guidance. Um, those were the prepared questions that we had from you, but we were also able to get some questions from um, the larger community. So I'm going to start um, with the first question that we received. Um, for this question, um, the person is asking that um, just how do you guys think about these questions or these concepts? Um, and the first part of this question is, why is it better to be a monk than to spend your life in the service of others? So uh, this kind of implies that monks don't do any service, but living in sansar means that you're like continuously doing service to everyone, which I feel like it, it's not true. When you live in sansar, uh, you spend a majority of the time on yourself trying to uh, sustain your own life. And of course, I don't mean that we don't serve others. Like you can, uh, you support your family, donate charity, help the poor, help animals, but I feel like the biggest service is being done by monks and nuns because when they renounce the world and they renounce every sin, they are actually, they're making a promise not to harm even a single living being from like the smallest Akindi all the way to Panchindia. And this, it's called Abhaydan. And this is like the biggest service you can give. And to add on to this, um, you can have, there's a company, like imagine a company and there are all the uh, low-level employees, and then the middle one, the managers, and then there's the CEO, finally. I feel like uh, Sadhu and Sadhviji Bhagwans, especially Acharya yeah. Bhagwans, yeah. Are, yeah. are the CEOs of a com of the company, and this is Jin Shasan. They might not be doing any like ground-level work, but the guidance that they give, the knowledge that they give to the rest of the Sangh, is what inspires them to continue to do dharma, and this carries on the Jin Shasan. So they're like, uh, so it's not like monks and nuns aren't doing any service. Yeah, um, the second part, I guess, of this question, so again, this person just wants to know how you guys think about these questions or these concepts. The second part is, why is having likes and dislikes bad? Um, why can't I be happy, for example, when I buy an ice cream cone? When you buy an ice cream cone, 
the happiness is not permanent. It is very short. Until you finish the ice cream, you will be happy. But after that, you will definitely crave for more. Is that right? So, uh, the happiness, like, likes and dislikes are basically lag and wish. And there's no way that lag and wish can be good because they're what create passions in us. And that's what makes us bond, uh, buy more karma. And that's what increases the cycle of life and death and sansar. So, you can be happy when you buy a cone of ice cream, but let's just say that you're sick and you have a fever and someone buys you a cone of ice cream. Would you be happy then? Let's say that it's freezing cold outside. You wouldn't be happy to buy an ice cream cone, would you? And let's just say that you bought a fifth ice cream cone after you already ate four. You wouldn't be happy. You would be feeling sick because this is what materialistic pleasure is. It isn't real pleasure. It's a mirage. And we're all chasing after it. Uh, we're believing that we're happy, but when in reality, we're just momentarily alleviating the pain that is like prevalent in Sansai. Those are very good points. Um, again, this person wants to know how you think about these questions or these concepts. Um, the third part is, why is attachment bad? Um, science says you are happiest when you have quality relationships? Well, definitely uh, attachment can be good as long as it's with the right entities. Like attachment towards Dev Guru Dharma is definitely a good thing because uh, I, I definitely am attached to my Guruji. And this attachment is good because it's what leads me towards doing what she likes for me and it leads me towards binding less karmas. But the same attachments, when they're materialistic, all they do is they create passions in you, like, you know, prod man maya lo. Because when you're attached to something and you don't get it, you feel sad, angry. And when you do indulge in this attachment, it leads to asati, which is basically addiction. Addictions, yeah. And it leads you to binding more karmas thus increasing the cycle of sansar. Thank you guys for answering. Um, and the last part of this question is, why do I need to strive for that ultimate happiness if the smaller happinesses in my life are keeping me happy? Are they really keeping us happy? It, it's like, if you have a chance to gain ultimate happiness, why would you stop here? It's kind of like if you watch a pig rolling around in the mud and the pig is happy, right? Because that's what it's, it's been born and like, since it's been born, it's been enjoying itself in pleasures like mud and dirt. And we're watching it and we're thinking, how can you enjoy this when you can enjoy being clean? So that's kind of like our gurus are looking down on us they're watching us enjoy ourselves in the dirt, like rolling around in the dirt. That is actually just materialistic pleasures that we find in Sansa. And they're thinking, how can they be enjoying this when you can enjoy being clean of your passions, your karmas? And they want to pull us out of the mud, but we're not, we're resisting for some reason. Like, like the question says, why, why do I have to strive for ultimate happiness? But it, I don't know, that seems kind of crazy. Why would you not want moksha when it's right there? You definitely have to give up something. Like if you want to pass an exam, you have to spend many nights before studying hard. You might have to give up other activities you like, like, I don't know, hobbies, sports. But the, the happiness that you feel when you pass the exam is definitely much higher than you would have been just sitting there enjoying anything, any other trifling pleasures. Okay, that's all. Thank you guys so much for answering all four parts of that question. Um, the next question that we got from our community is, do you have any advice for finding the strength to be comfortable about adopting a giant diet, i.e. no root vegetables in public or eating out with friends? For the most part, um, I follow a strict diet, giant diet at home, but when I go out, I don't hold myself back to the same standards and just eat whatever vegetarian option is available. 
Sometimes it's hard to eat out with a large group, whether it's with friends or for work, and finding a place that co- accommodates a giant diet. So I feel like I have to compromise. Mm-hmm. You should take it step by step. Like first, you can make a limit that in a month or an year, I won't have more than two or three times. Or else you can completely stop having some root vegetables like potatoes or onions or whatever you're comfortable with. Then you can take your own food with you somewhere. You might feel uncomfortable or embarrassed by doing this. But really, everyone else is also comfortable in following their religion. So you can just say that I have these dietary, like not restrictions, but preferences. So your friends will understand if they ask, like, why are you restricting yourself? You should enjoy. You can say that I have my own preferences. You can just do step by step until you think. And also you should set a goal that in one or two years, I want to completely stop myself from having these root vegetables. Thank you guys so much for that advice. Um, the next question we have from our community is, is there anything in the current Jain religion or practices that you don't have faith in or you think should be changed? Well, first of all, uh, like everything that we uh, receive in Jainism is actually the words of our Tirthankar Bhagwans uh, passed down to, uh, to us through Acharya Bhagwans. And so we don't really have the right to even challenge these concepts, these principles. But uh, definitely, um, there are things that can be changed. And my guru then ex- uh, explains it like this. Uh, the rules and like principles that we have in Jainism are like a flagpole. And the practices that we do are like the flag. The flag can wave in any direction depending on the wind, the current situation. But the flagpole always stay, stands upright and in the same position. So uh, there are Gita Acharya Bhagwans, which are basically the wise and learned Acharya Bhagwans of our son, that can bring about changes in like the practices that we do. But meanwhile, the policy, uh, the sorry, the principle, which is the flagpole, always stays the same. Thank you for giving us your thoughts on that. Um, The next question we have from our community is, how much impact have your parents had and what guidance have you availed from them? How do you plan to retain the relationship with them in the future? Okay. Uh, Our parents are definitely the foundation for everything. And they're the reason that we are taking Diksha because uh, at a very young age, our parents were the only support we had, and they guided us in the right direction. So when I was born, I was born in Denver, and there was no temple there. But uh, by the time I was two years old, we had moved to Detroit, and my parents had bought a house that was very close to the temple. So they take me there to do puja. They enrolled me in study class when I was old enough. And these sanskars that they gave me, I carried on with, uh, I carried with me. And... Uh, they also made the, like the integral decision to move to India. And without that, definitely we would not have been able to take Diksha. The best part was that we chose to move to Varudra. And the next year, like the year after we moved, was Gurudev's Chatamas in the same city. That was an amazing decision on their part. And who knows, like Gurudev's grace brought us together. After that, it was definitely my parents' permission uh, for me to leave school after I graduated and um, stay with my Guruji. So I would like to thank them for giving me permission to like uh, move ahead on this path. Okay, Okay, that's all. Um, and the follow-up question we have for you is what emotions did your parents, especially your mom, go through when they were giving permission for Diksha? My dad was like um, practical. So 
he just wanted to make sure that both of our desire to take diksha was firm and strong and that if we leave school too early it might be dangerous and if we turn back from this path so he waited until he was sure that we were firm in our desires and that it was real not just something temporary also he said that i should finish 10th grade and my sister should finish 12th grade and then after that it will be okay if you leave school but also both my parents were really happy about our decision to take diksha even though they have attachment on us they want to make sure that we will be happy and take the path that we really desire and not just uh like because we desired but also because they care for our souls and they want us to go the most right they don't want um to hinder us from this path so even though it might have been like a little hard on them but they know that we are happy and we are safe with our guruji's so overall they are uh, very willingly and happily giving us to this uh to them. Thank you guys for um, answering that. Um, the next question we have for you from our community is how important is following the rituals a right thing versus making changes to accommodate um, the growing changes in today's society? Okay, um, well, this is kind of similar to that earlier question about uh, if you feel like changing anything in the um, policies of Jainism and Definitely, I think that uh, it's all up to a Gita Acharya Bhagwan who can who is like eligible to make the decisions of what to change and when. And we are definitely not knowledgeable enough to be uh, making these changes ourselves. If we ever need advice, if we're confused, then we should definitely just go to an Acharya Bhagwan and ask for their advice. Um, so changes like these have been made uh, in history and all of them by a great Acharya Bhagwan. Okay, thank you guys for answering that. Um, the next question we have for you is, what was your motivation to take Diksha? In your opinion, which life is more challenging? Um, do you believe you are selecting a less challenging or more challenging life? Mm -hmm. um. Um, I don't really know that, but I am sure that the path of taking Diksha will make me happier as I go on. And I have really considered everything. And it seems much better to let go of all these attachments and renounce the materialistic world. And uh, people always, I think people um, mainly know about the challenging aspect of sadhu dharma because uh, what they hear about is all the hardships that they face, like Bihar and Loch and go, going and getting Lochi. And, um, but what people don't know about is actually the love that you receive when you take Diksha. Uh, living under a Guruji is not just doing, like receiving orders from them. It is, uh, it is a wonderful relationship that you have and your Guruji uh, showers so much love on you that it's kind of impossible once you take Diksha to remember anything else. And uh, not only that, but like the Sadhu or Sadhviji family that you go and live with, it is really wonderful. And living um, with my Guruji definitely helped me experience this love. So there's definitely a challenging part to it. There's a challenging part to everything in life. But along with this, when you take Diksha, uh, the love that you receive is definitely worth it. And it's what keeps you going through the whole journey. Thank you guys for answering that. Um, the next question we have is, do you guys go to Marasai Ji often? Yes, after Obdhan Tap, if we went during summer vacations or any other, like Diwali, Christmas, all that. And then after 10th grade, we went for two whole years to do strong training for Diksha. And we went very often at that time. And then in during Gurudev's Chumaso in Vadodara, 
every weekend we went and there was even a shibir for kids. We attended all those things. So I think that exposure is definitely an important part uh, because uh, staying, like, uh, you might go into London, but then that's not really enough to build an attachment. But when I went and actually stayed with my Guruji, uh, staying with her all day, and uh, that helped me, like, become more comfortable with the life that they live there. It helped me acclimatize, and uh, that's why, I, like, for staying there for two years definitely made me sure that uh, I'd be able to live there. Thank you guys for answering. Um, another question we have from our community is, as a mom, what can I do for my children to let them know that there is this path called Diksha which can be taken? For that, you can like take your kids to the derasar and put them in study class. About Diksha. Oh, yes. From that, you can get like the basics of Jainism. But then you can, when you when, whenever you come to India, you should definitely take them to Marat Sahibs so that they can learn about how they live and all that. You should give some pointers every day that are related to Diksha or Sahibs. And you can... Okay, uh, like when you live in America, um, Sadhus and Sadhvis, uh, you don't see any of them. So it's kind of like Diksha is a distant concept and not something that people expose to like they are, the kids are here. So definitely when you come to India, bring your kids to like, just for maybe a day to stay with or Sadhu or Sadhuji Marat Sahib. And also I feel like um, the angle with which you present uh, Sadhuji one to your kids really matters because like I said earlier, people only focus on the hard parts of it, but they don't talk about what a wonderful family that Sadhus and Sadhujis really are. And um, they don't talk about like a guru's love or the love for living beings that actually uh, pushes people to take diksha. Um, and the question I got for you guys is, is it okay for parents to bring their kids to you guys to do your vandan after their, your diksha? Oh, of course you can come. We'd love it. And definitely we want you to, uh, we love to introduce you to our Gurujis. Um, we mentioned Kalan's Gurudev, but I didn't say my Guruji's name. Uh, her name is Pravachan Prabhavika Param Pujya Sadhviji Sri Samvig Nidhi Sri Jimalat Sai. And she is a wonderful Sadhviji. So I would love it if you came and did one thing to her. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, the next question we have from our community is, what has given you the courage to leave this worldly life behind? It is the caring nature of my guru that has given me the courage. Because whenever I go to stay there, I do not even remember all the materialistic things at home. Like We don't even feel like when we go there... We forget all about TV and our phones. And I even forget about my brother. Like, I don't call him for a week. And then, like, my parents remind us to call each other, to call them. And that is when we phone. And then, it is that the amount of happiness we get there is, like, much more than we get at home. That is why it has given us the courage that we can easily take this path. And my Gurudev has an amazing example. Like he says, if you have a handful of change in your hands and and someone's offering you a hundred dollar bill, like would you even have to think about letting go of the change before grabbing the hundred dollars? It it's not courage what we have right here. It's just like we're looking at what we're getting in return from taking diksha, and it's definitely much better than anything we could experience in sansar. And also the attachment that we have with our Guruji is strong enough to overpower any other attachments we have in the world. Thank you guys so much for showing us your thought process there. Um, another question we have from our community is, 
Given the increase in nutritional deficiencies and dental diseases within the Jain Sadhu community, how would you manage any health problems if they arise for you as a Sadhu? Mm -hmm. It is that if it's really required, then you're allowed to like ask for a doctor or someone to come and they will give some advice or some diet the changes that you should make or supplements, medicines and all that. And, you know, nowadays, uh, everyone is having uh, nutritional problems because of junk food, canned, tinned and adulterated food items and all that. So, so it's not like this deficiency is just confined to Sadhu and Sadhviti Maharaj sites. Actually, over there, uh, like our first priority is to our health. Because when you have a healthy body, you can do sadhana, actually. So um, I feel like uh, that's not really a problem. Like our Guruji's definitely, they will um, take every measure to ensure that our health is proper. And definitely, if any problems arise, you're allowed to consult a doctor, take medicines and so on. You can brush your teeth and maintain good dental hygiene. Thank you guys so much. Um, and that was the last question we had from our community. Um, we wanted to give you guys um, the chance to give us any final pieces of advice or messages that you may have for us. It is that you should definitely plan to come to India. And when, if you do that, you should definitely <laughs> take your kids. Or if you are a kid, then you should definitely go and do one then to Gurudev because Gurudev really likes like people from USA and all that like he loves explaining Jain concepts and all that and you can easily answer all your doubts and because Gurudev has seven about 55 years of experience of Diksha his answers will be much better than ours and and also if you're planning to come to India then please plan to come this January like because our Diksha is on Posh uh, Sujodas, that's the uh, Titi, but it's January 24th, 2024, and we would love it if you would attend. I know that a lot of people are already coming, but please, it would be it, like, it would mean the world to us if you guys came. Okay. Thank you guys so much again for the final piece of advice. Um, one thing we wanted to ask for you guys is if we could do your parents' darshan so we could also show our respect to them. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. We just want to say Kukubanumana to you guys for um you know letting us set. Oh, can you hear me? Um here is uh Vineet. Pranam, everyone. Hello, Uncle. Pranam. Sorry. We are setting up. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, we just want to say Kukumanamodna to you guys. Um, and thank you guys so much for helping us set this up. Um, everything no that Danya Ben and Karen Pai have told us has been really inspirational and definitely will make an impact on our community. Um, we also wanted to ask you guys if you have any message for us. Um, well, 
No, I think uh, first, actually, I'd like to apologize, you know, for the first 10 minutes, uh, some issue with the laptop out here. But hope, uh, you know, these guys, they were, have been able to address uh, most of your queries. Uh, from my side, I would just say, like, you know, uh, I mean, they have just started on this path. Uh, hardly last three years is what they got in touch with uh, gurus extensively and uh, learned whatever they could, you know, and whatever they have digested so far, that's what they have shared. But uh, most of the questions, uh, I mean, I haven't uh, heard, like, you know, I was not sitting here. But I, I'm, I assume, like, you know, most of the questions would be uh, right from fundamental to quite deep enough, uh, you know, which is going to impact uh, all of your lives. So uh, one sincere request from my side is, uh, you know, you should should definitely approach a learned guru, a Nidgrant guru, uh, you know, Maha, uh, <coughs> Panchvratari uh, Sadhu Sadhvi Bhagwan. And uh, whenever you are in India, and uh, these days, I mean, uh, I think uh, you all are fortunate that some of the Acharya Bhagavans, they are also doing some online, uh, <clears throat> you know, conferences as well. But I think uh, through exchange of letters or whatever, uh, I think you should be able to get most of these answers. And uh, without understanding and getting deep enough clarity, I think uh, taking up all wrong assumptions from our side, uh, that's something which I would uh, probably discourage and uh, approach any any learned uh, uh, Guru Bhagavans, you know, whenever you have a chance to visit India or talk on the phone, uh, whatever is permissible. I'm happy that you have all this curious uh, curiosity about our religion. And yeah, you need to find out answers for yourselves. And uh, for that, uh, like he said, uh, you need to get in touch with her uh, Su Guru, which is very important. So he will show you the path. All your uh, all your yeah. doubts and uh, 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 queries, no. Uh, anything, uh, dilemmas in your life, uh, what to choose, if you have choices to make. Uh, he can help you uh, to, you know, uh, he can show you the ra right path because he knows what is written in the Shastras what Mahaviswami Bhagwan uh, gave us, uh, how we should live our life. So, yeah, all the best. And whenever you come to India, make sure that uh, you go to Palitana, that is okay, but you need to also get in touch with a guru. No, thanks for providing this opportunity as well. You know, I think both the kids, they are definitely uh, deeply indebted and obligated as well. Uh, I mean, they, they enjoyed their lives while they were in U.S. and especially the grace of Bhagwan, you know, uh, the part Shala and everything. So I think uh, this is the least probably they can do from their side as well, uh, trying to address some of the queries. Uh, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you guys again so much. Um, for everybody in our audience, we're going to be dropping a feedback form just so we as YJA can kind of gauge um, who our audience was today, as well as see what you guys want from us in the future. Um, so we can try and cater to your wants. Um, again, thank you so much, Tanya Ben and Karan Pai for taking the time today to talk to us. Um, it's been really impactful and kububa no modna to you. If we have presented anything that went against the teachings of Bhagwan Mavir, we sincerely ask for mm -hmm. forgiveness. Michami Dukram, and thank you guys mm -hmm. all so much for coming today. Do you need to say something? <laughs> I don't think they heard you guys actually. Okay, I can say it. You can yeah. Yeah. Just... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Huh? okay, I can hear. Huh? Sorry. Some other question? Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Tanya Ben and Karen Pai again. Um, everything you've said has made such a big impact on our community and we really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to us mm -hmm. today and answering all of the questions that we had. Um, we just wanted to say if we presented anything that went against the teachings of Bhagavan Mahavir, we sincerely ask for forgiveness. 
thank you guys so much for coming today. Thank you. And it, it was like nothing for us. You know? It I was really it. enjoyable. Thank you so yeah. much. And um, like my mom said, I'm happy to see your curiosity. And definitely, I hope you'll get all your questions answered. And in answering any questions, I hope if I have said anything uh, against the teachings of Bhagwan, then I would also like to ask from Vichami Dukram. Also, I'm sure that Gurudev's answers will be much better than ours. So if we've um, left any doubt unanswered, please, uh, you could come into contact with our Gurudev. Mm -hmm.